Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and in this video, I'll show you how to photograph a total solar eclipse, as well as planning a trip to maximize your chances of seeing one. I've personally chased and photographed three total solar eclipses across three continents, and at the time of making this video, I'm planning my fourth. So in this tutorial, I'll share everything that I've learned so far. And if you're interested in lunar eclipses instead, I've got a separate video all about them. A total solar eclipse is one of nature's most spectacular sights. As the moon passes between the Earth and Sun, it gradually obscures the disk into an ever-decreasing crescent. Then, for a brief period of totality, it covers the Sun entirely, blocking the bright disk sufficiently to temporarily darken the sky around it and reveal the wispy coronal atmosphere to the naked eye. If this weren't enough, sometimes a tiny sliver of the Sun's bright disk can peek through the Moon's uneven surface, just before or following totality, to produce a fleeting diamond ring effect, where for a brief moment, you'll see the outer atmosphere as a circle, punctured by an intensely bright portion, almost like a precious jewel. Many thanks to my friend Eric Cheng for his wonderful time-lapse videos here from the 2017 eclipse. In this tutorial, I'll show you how to capture all the phases of an eclipse, but before going any further, there's two important points to make. First, always use a certified solar filter to view or photograph the partial phases of a solar eclipse. And second, if anything goes wrong with your camera gear, I'd recommend not wasting any precious time trying to fix it. After all, depending on the eclipse and your location, totality may last less than a couple of minutes. And believe me, that time is better spent enjoying the spectacle with your own eyes rather than diagnosing and attempting to resolve a camera problem. Okay, let's get started. The first step to photographing a solar eclipse is of course finding when and when the next one will take place. Now, solar eclipses typically occur two to four times a year, but not all of them are total and not all of them are in easy places to get to. Some eclipses are only partial, where the moon only obscures a portion of the disk before then moving away again. Others are annular eclipses, where the moon may pass completely in front of the sun, but due to a mismatch of distances, actually leaves a bright ring visible around it, preventing the faint corona atmosphere from revealing itself. Both are lovely to see, but don't come anywhere near the wonder of a true total solar eclipse. Believe me, if you've only ever seen a partial or annular eclipse, you've missed out on the grand finale. So if you get a chance to view proper totality, I'd go for it without hesitation. In theory, viewing a total solar eclipse should be simple. Find out where and when the next one takes place and ensure you're within the narrow path of totality directly underneath the shadow of the moon. NASA kindly provides very detailed maps and timings for eclipses past and in the future, so many thanks to the various teams behind them over the years, including Mr. Eclipse himself, Fred Espinak, and the current Scientific Visualization Studio team. If you're interested in the April 2024 eclipse across the USA, I have links below to maps and timings generated by a team led by Michaela Garrison with Ernie Wright and tech support from Ian Jones and Lawrence Schuler. Your work is truly invaluable and we salute you all. Now, the path of totality varies in width with each eclipse, but you're typically looking at a strip roughly 100 miles wide. And to maximize your time enjoying totality, you'll want to be as close to the middle of it as possible. As you move out towards the edges of the path, the period of totality will gradually decrease. And if you go outside the path entirely, you're only going to witness a partial eclipse. So make sure you're in that path. But don't assume that every eclipse path will simply pass over a location that's convenient for you. Some will cross remote or even dangerous regions, perhaps crossing a mountain range, deep jungle, or another wilderness area. Some eclipse paths aren't even over land at all and can only be seen from the ocean. Now, while it is possible to view an eclipse from the sea or even from the air, most of us will want to be on terra firma, especially if you're into photography. Then there's the timing. An eclipse could take place when the sun is low in the sky, making it hard to view, or perhaps during a season when cloud or rain is likely to obscure it. So when an eclipse comes along that's in a fairly easy to access location, positioned nice and high in a hopefully cloudless sky, you should doubly go for it. Once again, I've been lucky enough to view and photograph three total solar eclipses. My first in Europe in 1999, my second in Zambia in 2001, and my third in the USA in 2017. Each were very different in terms of preparation and the final experience, so here's what I've learned. The first step is of course to study NASA's detailed maps for upcoming eclipses to find the next one that you're going to be able to access, before then drilling down to find a suitable location for viewing and photography. You'll obviously want to find somewhere within the eclipse path that matches your budget for travel, both in terms of cost and time. 
But while it's easy to choose a nice town or city located conveniently close to the centre of the path and just plonk yourself somewhere comfortable to await the action, there is another big factor to consider, and that's the weather and how to mitigate for bad conditions. After all, NASA's maps may help position you directly on the path, but on the day you may equally find yourself under a big cloud that refuses to budge. A certain location may be very convenient and affordable, but it's absolutely no good if it's generally raining or shrouded in fog at that time of year. So it's important to check historic weather reports to choose a location with the best chance of clear skies, and then keep up to date with the latest forecasts and predictions as the big day approaches. Because even if clouds threaten to spoil the show on the day, all is not lost. Simply driving a few miles to either side could open a weather window, which is why I also choose a location based on access to fast and reliable roads that run close to or ideally within the path, while also trying to avoid sections of the path which could delay or entirely prevent movement like borders, coastlines or other pinch points. And while basing yourself in a city may seem tempting in order to access accommodation and other facilities, as well as having the potential to compose a shot with say a local landmark, they're rarely quick to get in or out of if you need to in a hurry. So I generally choose smaller towns or even rural locations for an actual viewing site. So while the path of the 1999 eclipse crossed a small portion of the UK, not too far from where I live, my astro pals and I rejected it as it was a very narrow area right up against the coast with nowhere to go if the conditions deteriorated, which on the day they did. Instead, we drove to Metz, close to the French-German border, in order to access a broad swathe of the path, east and west, which ended up being a good call as the clouds also moved in on that location on the big day. So after hurriedly studying radar weather maps with only a few hours to go, we set off westward, eventually pulling over into a motorway lay-by near to the English Channel. Less than half an hour later, we'd set up all our gear and managed to view and photograph totality, gathering more than a few bemused onlookers during the process. Back in 1999, I was photographing the stills with film and I was capturing video with a standard definition Canon camcorder onto which you could mount EF lenses, the tiny crop sensor delivering a huge view. So just for fun, here's a short clip of the totality that we recorded on the camcorder. Returning to the location, you may be satisfied to simply find a nice cafe, campsite, park or view within the path and just keep your fingers crossed for good conditions. But if you've invested a lot of time or money getting there, it's good to have options if the conditions don't play ball. Beyond the weather, it's also useful to take note of the sun's position and elevation during the time of totality from a proposed location as a building or natural feature or even a tree could block the view. I use Sun Surveyor, an excellent phone app which uses augmented reality to project the sun or moon's position at any time in the future or past against a live view from your camera. For the 2001 eclipse in Zambia, the path conveniently passed right over the capital city of Lusaka, which we flew into. And with almost guaranteed clear skies at that time of year, we simply needed to find a calm and unobstructed view. Our actual hotel let us access their roof, which proved ideal for the event, where we watched it alongside the staff. I think that was probably my easiest eclipse. For 2017 in the USA, viewing the eclipse was incorporated towards the end of a family road trip, traveling from east to west. Now our family trips normally have quite a fluid itinerary, but as the big day approached, we narrowed our direction to keep close to the path, taking note of weather and possible viewing locations. After all, if you spot an unexpectedly great location or have to stop for whatever reason, it's reassuring to be close or within the actual viewing window. Then with only a day or two to go, we ended up basing ourselves in Baker City, Oregon, scouting the nearby area for suitable viewing positions. Now the only problem with a fluid plan like this is finding accommodation close to eclipse day with most towns on the path being sold out long in advance. And my final location tip is to have somewhere to stay not just the night before the eclipse, but also the night after. After all, people may gradually arrive at different times to prepare for an eclipse, but most of them generally leave straight after it, which can cause huge travel delays, especially where there's a pinch point like a bridge or simply getting out of a city. After the 2017 USA eclipse, our fluid schedule had us heading southeast, planning to stop at the first available motel, possibly in Idaho, or maybe even still in Oregon. But we didn't end up finding one until many hours later in Salt Lake City. Each eclipse really is a learning event for the next one. At the time I made this video, I was planning my trip to view the April 2024 eclipse in the USA, which conveniently passes directly over several large cities. 
the best weather prospects are definitely earlier in the day around Texas, but my trip would also have to work with flights in and out of New York, as well as a road trip that was heading north from there. So with that in mind, I'm concentrating on a section of the path in New York State, across Vermont and into Canada. Cities including Buffalo, Rochester, Burlington and Montreal are all good options for accommodation, with the ability to access quieter areas nearby that are still within the path. And while the weather prospects do grow worse as the eclipse heads northeastward, there are road opportunities along it to seek a clear window if necessary. So if you're planning to be there, I wish you the best of luck. And if it's already happened, do let me know in the comments how you got on. Okay, now for the photography part. And again, I'll mention that depending on your location and the eclipse in question, you may only have a couple of minutes of totality or even less. So if anything goes wrong with your gear, I'd recommend forgetting altogether about your photos and just enjoying the event in person. After all, you'll probably be shooting at long focal lengths where the focus and framing can easily go wrong and you may not have time to resolve any issues. Okay, so there are two main parts of a total solar eclipse. First, the partial eclipse before and after totality, and secondly, the brief period of totality itself. Each has completely different requirements for both photography and viewing. The first and most important point to make is it remains dangerous to look directly at the sun during the partial phases, and that even includes the final moments just before totality or those just following. At these times, the sun is still bright enough to damage your eyesight, not to mention your equipment. If you want to view the partial phases of a solar eclipse or photograph them, you will need an appropriate filter. And by that, I mean proper solar filters with official safety certification, not just any old stacked neutral density filters, sunglasses, or a welding hood. But you won't need a filter or glasses to view the brief period of totality. If it is a true total solar eclipse and you are within the path, you can view totality directly and shoot it safely without any filters. But immediately before and after, you'll need to use filters to protect your eyes and camera gear. So be ready to put that filter back on again as soon as it's over. Solar glasses and filters in a variety of sizes for camera lenses, binoculars or telescopes are available from most astronomy shops. I've successfully used pre-assembled and also homemade filters using Barda Astro Solar Film for all three of my solar eclipses. And I can also recommend products by astronomy giant Celestron. Just remember that demand will be high approaching an eclipse, so don't leave it to the last minute to get the equipment you need. Many solar filters will change the color of the sun's surface, typically to a bluish silver tint. So if you'd like to present your partial phases with a more attractive yellow color, you'll need to do it in post. The partial phases are essentially monochrome anyway, so I normally turn the image to grayscale in post before then adding a duotone with the desired tint. Moving on, the sun's brightness gives the impression of an object that's bigger in the sky than it really is. But in reality, the sun and the moon are both relatively small subjects. So if you want them to be large in your picture, you'll need a lens with a very long focal length. In fact, if you want to completely fill the frame with the sun or the moon, you'll need to shoot at an equivalent focal length of over 2000 millimeters. But don't worry, that is rarely what you'll actually want to photograph a total solar eclipse. For me, the most unique and attractive total solar eclipse photos include the faint, wispy coronal atmosphere surrounding the sun, which can extend to over twice its diameter. So to avoid cropping any of it, you can actually get away with a shorter focal length lens. And I'd recommend something in the range between 500 and 700 millimeters for the best results. Now you can achieve that sort of range with a super zoom camera, although if this is your plan, I would recommend using a higher quality one with manual control over the focus and exposure, as I'll describe later. Something like the Sony RX10 Mark IV is ideal. For the best results though, use a DSLR or mirrorless camera fitted with a suitable telephoto lens. Cameras with cropped APS-C or four-third sensors have an advantage in terms of reach as they effectively magnify the subject by around 1.5 or two times respectively. And that allows you to use more common and affordable lenses to deliver the desired field of view. So to get to around 600 mil equivalent, you could use a lens with a 100 to 400 range. These are ideal for eclipse photography on a cropped frame camera, and even a 70 to 300 can produce a fair result. If you'd prefer to use a full frame body though, you'll ideally need a longer focal length lens to start with, which in turn will be larger, heavier, and more expensive. Consider zooms with 100 to 500, 150 to 600, 200 to 600, or 200 to 800 ranges, or of course a 100 to 400 with say a 1.4 times converter. 
If you are using a zoom lens though, do be aware of possible creep where the barrel may retract under its own weight when pointing upwards. So I'd recommend doing some tests beforehand to see if this is going to be an issue with your proposed lens. Alternatively, to avoid potential zoom creep, just seek out a prime lens instead. Canon full frame mirrorless owners could go for say the RF 600mm f11 as a light and more affordable way to achieve a long focal length as its modest aperture won't actually be a big issue for this kind of subject. Back in 2001, I used a Canon EF 400mm 5.6L telephoto lens with a 2x converter on a full frame EOS 5 35mm camera loaded with Fuji Pro View 100 film. The resulting total of 800mm proved perfect for the partial phases and also for the prominences, but for my longer exposures of the coronal atmosphere during totality, 800mm was actually a tad too long and it did crop some of those wispy shapes. So on full frame, I'd recommend pairing a 400mm prime lens with a 1.4x converter instead. Fast forward a couple of decades to the 2017 Eclipse and I actually stuck with the EF 400mm Prime but that time mounted it on a Canon cropped DSLR delivering an effective focal length of 640mm. This proved to be perfect coverage for both prominences and those wider coronal shots and while this lens has sadly been discontinued you may find a used bargain at places like MPB plus you can adapt it to multiple mirrorless systems. And if you don't own or can't afford a long telephoto lens you could consider renting one for the job. Do beware that big lenses can find themselves booked out approaching popular events, so you may need to order early to secure one. Try borrow lenses in the US or hire a camera in the UK. A full view of the Corona may be the classic Eclipse shot, but there are other compositions that you could go for. If you have access to a very long focal length, how about taking shorter exposures around the edge of the sun during totality in an attempt to capture those nice prominences? Alternatively, why not go wide and attempt to include some scenery in your shot? Wide angle eclipse photos can look great, showing the entire sky with beautiful gradations around the tiny solar disk. You could also set up an interval timer to generate a time lapse video of the event. And even if your goal is just a totality shot, it's fun to also shoot the partial phases at regular intervals on either side in order to generate a composite image or even a time lapse video later. Again, these can work well whether you're shooting wide or long focal lengths. Indeed, you could devote one camera to automatically capture interval shots with its wide lens, while you concentrate on shooting the longer focal lengths on another camera by hand. In terms of the best camera, you can photograph a solar eclipse with just about any model, but for the greatest flexibility, I would recommend a DSLR or mirrorless body with interchangeable lenses and full control over the focus and exposure. Challenges you'll come up against include focusing on a subject that can be extremely bright or dark, readjusting focus if necessary when removing or replacing a filter, and easily changing exposures during the event. I'd also recommend practicing with your equipment before the event with your filter so that you can get used to focusing and the ideal exposures. I can't stress how important it is to become absolutely familiar with every aspect of your camera that you'll need on the day. You'll need to instinctively know where the right menus, buttons and dials are and also how to operate in both very bright and dark conditions as it does change fast during totality. If you intend to shoot a sequence for a composite or capture a detailed view at long focal length, you'll also obviously need some kind of tripod. Don't forget the rotation of the earth will mean that the sun will gradually move across the frame too. And if you're shooting with a long telephoto lens, you'll actually need to adjust it every few seconds to keep it centered. Typical tripod ball heads and basic three-way heads are the worst in this regard and I'd stay well clear of them for long telephoto work. Video heads with fluid adjustments do allow smooth adjustments but again an accidental knock can still scupper the mission. Personally speaking, I think the best options if you can afford them are geared tripod heads which can be precisely adjusted by twisting the knobs. A more advanced option is to use a driven equatorial mount which will counteract the rotation of the earth and keep a celestial subject still in the frame, freeing you from constant readjustments. These are perfect if you intend to film video and you just want to leave the camera. These are however specialist pieces of equipment that can be hard to set up especially in daylight. So unless you're an experienced astrophotographer, I'd recommend just using a tripod with a geared or a fluid head. Okay, so you're at your perfect location, you've got your gear set up and you're now ready to shoot. Due to the high dynamic range and the rarity of the subject, I'd always recommend shooting a total solar eclipse in the raw format. This is not the time for compression to scupper your potential for success. 
As always though, I'd also recommend recording JPEGs along with those raw files for quick and easy sharing after the event. In terms of the exposure, you will be dealing with a huge range of brightnesses during totality and on either side of it. But in my experience, the correct exposure can be entirely handled by adjusting the shutter speed alone with a fixed aperture and ISO for the partial phases and the prominences before then leaving the shutter speed fixed and mostly adjusting the ISO instead for those wispy corona shots. So first set your camera's exposure mode to manual. In terms of sensitivity, you should start with the camera's base value, typically 100 or 200 ISO. In terms of the lens aperture, you should be able to shoot near to the maximum value, that's the smallest F number for your lens, since the subject should be pretty close to the center of the frame where the optics should perform at their best. And an eclipse isn't hugely detailed anyway. I typically set the aperture to F8. This now leaves adjusting the shutter speed to deliver the ideal exposure for your initial shots. The correct shutter speed for the partial phases really does depend on your filter, but luckily you'll have plenty of time to make adjustments during the event at this stage, not to mention practicing on the full sun before the event. Once you've found a shutter speed that works for those partial phases, you should be able to use it for all of them right up to totality. Easy. Within totality itself though, that's a lot harder as there's a whole range of brightnesses you'll want to capture from intensely bright prominences around the edges to that dim coronal atmosphere. You'll also have to remember to remove your solar filter as the last diamond ring burst disappears and totality starts properly and then put it back on again at the other end. Depending on your filter, you may need to make minor adjustments to the focusing too. For totality, wide bracketing is the order of the day, and the easiest way to handle it is to simply start with a fast shutter speed, then gradually reduce it for multiple shots. At 100 ISO and f8, I found a range of between 500th of a second and around 15th of a second will give you a great range of chronal images to work with. If you're shooting one stop apart, you're looking at just six images in a sequence from 500th of a second to 15th, we should be possible during totality, hopefully still leaving you some time to view it in person with your own eyes. But do beware of slower shutter speeds when using very long focal length lenses and a fixed tripod. Due to the rotation of the earth, the sun will appear to move slowly across the frame, and at certain shutter speeds, the image can actually suffer from motion blur. At an equivalent focal length of around 600mm, I found the slowest shutter speed I could confidently use for a sharp image was around a 60th of a second. If you're using longer focal lengths, you'll need an even faster speed. Unfortunately, these shutter speeds will be too short to capture much of the corona shape at f8 and 100 ISO. So the solution then is to stop adjusting the shutter speed when you reach the slowest reliable value. So again, for me, that's around the 60th of a second at 600 mil. And from that point, increase the ISO sensitivity one stop at a time instead. You can see an example of this where I used 500th of a second to 100 ISO for the prominences and 50th of a second at 800 ISO for the corona. So an example set of exposures during totality for a 600 mil or thereabouts lens would be as follows. First, set the aperture to F8 in manual mode and leave it fixed for the duration of the event. Next, set the sensitivity to 100 ISO. Next, shoot your exposures at 1000th, 500th, 250th, 125th and 60th of a second before then leaving the shutter speed fixed at a 60th and doubling the sensitivity going forward. First at 200 ISO, then 400, then 800, then 1600, then 3200 ISO. This 10 shot sequence should capture everything from those very bright prominences to the wispiest coronal clouds. And it gives you the opportunity to combine several of them into an HDR image later if desired. Plus, you should be able to capture this sequence and still have time left to view the eclipse in person. If you're filming video, you'll probably already be using a shutter speed of say a 50th or a 60th of a second. So during totality, just gradually boost the ISO from 100 to 3200 and maybe back again for a ramping effect. Now you'll obviously have to be extremely careful to avoid wobbling the camera as you adjust the settings. And you may find that a more successful way to generate a video is to just shoot a series of stills at regular intervals to create a time lapse or simply leave another camera filming a wide angle view, generally in auto settings. And that's everything I've got for you. If you previously photographed or filmed an eclipse, I would love to hear in the comments what worked for you and as importantly, what didn't work, along with what you change or repeat for a future event. Good luck, clear skies, and enjoy these wonderful displays. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.